discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African-American community. This is Another View. Hello, I'm Lisa Godley, co-producer of Another View, filling in for our host, Barbara Ham Lee, who's on vacation. We're talking about a topic that has always tugged at my heartstrings, and that's the disproportionate number of African-American children who spend years waiting to be adopted. And for some, it just never happens. The majority fall into the special needs category. That's because they're over the age of six, or they have siblings they need to be placed with, or they have a specific physical, mental, or emotional need. Joining us is Tracy Brickhouse, Adoption Supervisor for Norfolk's Department of Human Services. Tracy was also an adopted child. Ruth Stewart, a mom with a biological son who decided to adopt a daughter and her husband, Emmanuel Stewart. And Winter Savage, who after years of waiting to be adopted, recently graduated out of the foster care system. Welcome all of you to Another View. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Stewart, I'm going to start with you because I've said it and I've heard other people say, if things were a little different, I'd adopt a child. I wonder what it was that made you decide to, to take that road and go through with it. You can I'll start, Ruth. Oh, okay, go ahead. Well, I was interested in adoption for a while. And when I saw DeAndre, it just came to light that she was the child that I wanted. So we got her. Okay. Emmanuel, were you all foster parents first? Yes, yes, and we still are. And love it. I love kids. So I got a lot of nieces and nephews. So never had one of my own. So this was great. Now, what was the process like for you? Long drawn. You have to be patient, you know, but over time, you, you learn, especially with the classes at social services that help you through it. So it was no problem. Okay. Now, Tracy, why is it with such a disproportionate number? Are, are we dragging our feet when it comes to adopting African-American children? What is it? Well, I would say, first of all, is a disproportionate number of African-American youth in foster care overall. So that would add to the disproportionality of African-Americans being available for adoption. So the numbers are high already overall, and then you add those that are available for adoption, that makes it even higher. Now, Winter, you and your brother were together originally yes, in foster care. Tell me a little bit about your story. Um, when I was six years old, my mother passed away, and I have three other siblings, and one of my brothers were killed in 2001, right before September 11th. And I have a baby brother named Tyreek, who is 17, going on 18 next month. And I have one brother that he was in and out of jail like my entire life, but he's finally been out for a year and he's doing great. But in foster care, me and Tyreek were just placed in a home. And I'm from Nupa News Social Services, and they weren't checking up on the children like they were supposed to. So it was like our feet were planted there, and we had to stay there. And then one day I just ran away. And when I ran away, they um, eventually my brother came behind me, but they couldn't keep us together. And I had a lot of animosity in me as a young child because of the things that I went through. And as I got older, I didn't really care for adoption anymore because I felt like I was too old. And I used to read a lot about statistics and demographics. And I read after the age of 10 or 11, people don't want to adopt children. They have a mind of their own because they want to be able to mold them and make them the way they want them to be. So, so okay. about, yeah. Tracy, that, that age, what is there a, a specific age where you just find that parents just, or people just aren't adopting children anymore? Well, I think most of the time uh, parents that come to the agency for purposes of adoption are oftentimes looking for a younger child. And I would say overall, not just for African American youth, but children in general that are over the age of 12 and older, they are harder to place because as Winter said, sometimes they don't want to be adopted or they have a different mindset and they also feel that they don't want to be separated from their biological family even if on paper your parental rights have been terminated. And in that respect, that's where we as an agency overall need to do more work in saying that even if your rights are terminated from your biological parents, the connection is never lost 
and would you be open to having a new permanent family for you to grow up and be raised in? So that's where we need to continue to do more work so we don't have situations to occur in such as a winter situation. Ruth Emanuel, was there ever a fear that um, your daughter's birth parents were going to come back and ask for? Well, I thought about that, but, you know, because it happened to us before. We were told that we were able to adopt, and at the last minute, at the last court hearing, a, I guess, a family member showed up and the child was taken from us. But in this case, we knew not to get our mind set that, okay, this is ours, until social services tell us point blank that she's ours. So we, we were ready, so it, it was not a problem. But you managed to make it through that, that first one. I think a lot of people would have been gun shy after what happened the first time. That, that taught us a lot because after the first time, that's when we said, all right, we're not gonna get our hopes up until we know it's definite. Okay, mm -hmm. and talk to me a little bit about your little girl. Well, DeAndre is two years old, and she's just great. She's a joy for to have. Everybody loves, yeah. Everybody loves her. Now, your biological son, did you have to sit down and talk to him saying, we're going to adopt DeAndre? De De yes. Yes, DeAndre. Uh -huh. And did you have to sit down and talk to him? How, how did you present that to him? Well, he was happy about it, you know, because he, he was the only one we had. and, and our, He was the only child, so bringing in another little sibling, I guess, a little girl. He was happy. He had no complaints, none whatsoever. He loves her to death and she loves him. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, when we were speaking earlier, you were telling me a little bit about some things that, that you saw that were needed for that particular age group. As you get older yes. and you're in the foster care system and you see that you're not going to be adopted, you said you even wanted to start a foundation yes, I do. or a nonprofit to help those yes. kids that are in that age group. I want to start an organization called Freedom and I wanted to be a group home also because once a foster child is in the foster care system, it does statistically categorize us and it makes us not want to tell people that we're in foster care. And I want kids to know it's not their fault that they're in foster care, it's their parents' faults. And like she said, when you interrupt a child from their home, they have a lot of animosity and they don't want to bond with the family. They feel like, why did you take me away from my home? And I realized that if their parents were good parents, they wouldn't be in a situation that we're in. So I just want to be a mentor to kids and show them that there's other ways to really uplift yourself other than foster care. Like foster care doesn't stop you from doing anything. It's just a label people try to give you. And foster really means to fall through. It means to make a dream come true. That's what foster really means. So. It's nothing to be really ashamed of. That's the way to look at it. Yeah. Tracy, what's, what's the process? If I decide right now I want to adopt a child, what would I go through? Well, if you want to go through a public agency, we have um, classes that you would need to take, and we call that Curriculum Pride Certification, and we have a whole resource development unit that is geared toward training foster parents and following up on their certifications. So once you would go through that training, then you would become a foster parent. If that's what you wanted to do, foster to adopt, then as the stewards did, they fostered for quite a while before they found their, their dream girl. Yes. And, um, and, and then once you have a child in your home where the rights become terminated, if that's the course that's meant for this particular child or family or youth group, group of children, then if the family's interested, the foster family's interested, then certainly at most times they are the first choice for selection for to be the adoptive parent. If a parent is not interested and a foster parent is not interested in adoption, then we also have to place a child on Areva, the Adoption Resource Exchange of Virginia, 60 days after parental rights are terminated. And then that gives the state authority to place this child's um, background, not, not with identifying information in their picture, on the state website and then also that also places them on the national website adoptuskids.org so then anybody across the country can see that a child is available for adoption if they have an interest they just register up there whether they're a professional or a parent looking and then they'll send an inquiry and they'll go back to the state office or Richmond office and then it'll filter down to that local 
public social service agency to that worker. And then once we get so many home studies, we have a committee at our agency that reviews home studies, a profile, the child is presented the committee, and then we try to identify the best family for the child. And then once we've identified like a first choice, second choice, then we will contact the agency that the family is working with or the family direct directly, and then we'll try to meet the family. And if there's still a go and a match, then we'll slowly do a transition depending on the child and the family. And then once that's all done, if it's a foster placement that's different, then we can do a foster to adopt. If it's a direct adoption placement, there's a paperwork process that we have to fill out a packet and then we can do an adoptive placement. If the child hasn't been there six months already, then there's a six month supervision process before we can do the paperwork to legal, finalize the legal adoption process. So I would say if it was, you didn't have a child in your home already, you're looking at maybe, depending on whether the rights are terminated after rights are terminated, at least a six to nine month process after that before a final order. But I guess one of the things that I shared is that families should be really aware that adoption is a lifelong commitment and that you should look at everything involving that child as well as your family, having them prepared, and also thinking that in the future this child still has a family, a history, and how are you going to prepare or talk to your child about that once they get of age, if that's something that you know, you're willing to do. Now, do the majority of adopted children come back looking to try and find their biological parents? Well, I would say I'm also in charge of the search process for our agency, and I would say on average at least twice a month I get the inquiry sent from the state because you have to go through the state to do a form, a disclosure form, and that's sent for people that have been adopted from the agency. Some of them probably around between the ages of uh, tw their, their 20s to 40s they've been adopted and they want to look for their bio family. So there's a process that the state has, that's also on their state website through the adoption portion, a disclosure form where they can send it in and it's filtered down. The information comes from the state, it's filtered down to the local agency saying that we've get, been given permission to do a search for this particular uh, adult who is an adoptee. And our process is we contract out with the agency to do the search and there is a fee associated with that and then between the agency that does the search in the state, they decide whether or not based on if the agency was able to identify the bio parents, whether or not they're gonna, the state is gonna approve the contact like as far as disclosing information between the two parties. Okay. Question I have for the stewards. Um, I've, I've grown up with people that didn't find out that they were adopted until they were adults. What's your philosophy for Deonda? Well, I feel like Deonda should, if she want to, um, she should have the right to go out and look for her biological mother or father. I totally when do you agree. When, do you, when would you all tell her that she was adopted? I think we'll probably talk about it when she's, wants to, when she's at that age to know what's going on. So I'm not going to hold anything back from her. So if she wants to know, we'll let her know. Okay. I want to take a little moment because you were talking about the state website and um, to take a look at some of the faces of the children that are up for adoption in the state of Virginia. And let's take a look. Mm -hmm.
something else came to mind when I was watching that. I, I hear different things, and you can probably clear this up better than anybody else. How expensive is it when you decide to adopt a child? Well, that depends on if you're going to go through a public agency or a private agency. If you're going to go through a public agency, it's really not an expense associated with that other than your time and patience, as Mr. Stewart referred to. Because with a public agency, most of the parents come in to foster and then they adopt. Now, the expenses towards finalization, we cover that through some funding that's already available through the federal government. If you go through a private agency, then you're going to have to pay for a home study and pay for the whole process. That could be thousands of dollars, and that's why some families opt to come through the public agency to adopt versus a private agency, although they may have to wait longer to find a child that they want to adopt. Okay. We have a couple of minutes left, and Ruth, I want to ask you, what do you say to a mom that's considering it? What would you advise her? What would you tell her? I uh, Think real hard on it and make, um, make sure you're ready for it and be a love of a parent. Okay. Emmanuel, what, what would you tell someone? Well, make sure it's what they want to do. Be patient and just have a lot of love for, the, for your child. That's it. Patience. Huh? Yes, patience. Patience is a very... Which you stated so beautifully earlier mm -hmm. what you wanted children that are in foster care to know. Do you have something else you want to leave us with? The five P's for children, which stands for proper planning prevents poor performance. So if they plan anything they want, they can bring to life positive thoughts, bring positive actions. And if every child thought like that, things would be fine. So. Wonderful. Thank you. I want to ask you a question because I didn't explore. You were an adopted child. When did your adopted parents, or did they wait until you were an adult, or when did they tell you you were adopted? I was seven years of age when I found out, so I kind of grew up with the knowledge. And of course, I was inquisitive as I got the more I got older. And my mom and my dad always told me that whenever you're ready, if you want to search, we'll be there as a support to you. Yeah. And I did eventually search, so I just I have that ex experience as far as search is concerned. But I was a baby when I was placed, so. The, some of the experiences that some people ex have as far as multiple placements, I, I didn't have that many experiences, but I was seven. Okay. Now, did you ever meet your birth parents? I, I did meet my birth mother. Yes, I did. And I have siblings, too. Oh, you found you had siblings. Mm -hmm. Okay. So right. I keep in touch with um, my sister. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Your former relationships. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'd like to thank all of you so much for coming out. Thank you to Tracy Brickhouse. Thank you, Ruth and Emmanuel Stewart. And thank you so much, Winter Savage, for joining us. When we come back, we're going to show you how one woman's personal struggle is changing the lives of women all across the globe. When I first met Nicole Cleveland, I thought she was sweet and kind and caring, but I'd soon learned that there was so much more to this gentle spirit who always had something kind to say. Nicole is on a mission. As chief editor and founder of Breathe Again magazine, she takes the personal struggles and tragedies of women all over the globe and shows how they made it through as a way to help others in similar situations overcome. Like many great ideas, Breathe Again magazine was created out of a need. Five years ago, my husband and I were separated. He's a minister, I'm a minister. Um, we were in the church, busy doing things in the church, and he decided he didn't want to be married or in the ministry anymore, so he decided to leave. It was five days after I gave birth to our third child. So, you know, in the midst of our separation, I went through several emotions, ups, downs, twists and turns. I found a lot about myself and I decided, you know, something needed to be out there to encourage other women and I didn't find it. I had no one to go to to say, 
this is how I made it through, um, or, or this is what I did. I was hurting just like you, and this is how I made it. Nothing was out there, so I decided to create something. Nicole says her first idea was to make a print version, but the cost to publish a print version was high. And at the same time, she noticed that everything was going to the internet in 2004, and it costs very little money, so she decided to create her magazine online. Much like the creation of the magazine, the title Breathe Again was drawn from Nicole's own personal struggle. We have no family down here, so it was me and these three children and this little bitty baby that was five days old and one month old as, as she got as she got older and it was all me all the time some you know some women from the church they would help out sometimes they would take the children but when he finally came to himself and he decided that he wanted to be active again in the children's lives he took the kids and when i dropped the kids off after i left i said oh I'm able to breathe again. So it's Breathe Again magazine. Since Nicole launched Breathe Again in June of 2006, she's received feedback not only from women across America, but in countries like Germany, Africa, and Spain. More than 12,000 people visit the site every month. People emailing us, telling us that they've read a story and it has encouraged them. It has allowed them to get through the day. Um, a lot of people aren't vocal like myself. I, my family says that I tell my business too much, but I look at it like I'm not telling my business. I am encouraging someone else. I'm sharing what I went through and what others have gone through to help someone else. You know, I want someone to go to the magazine, read a story and say, if she made it, then I know I can make it. Each edition of Breathe Again covers a different woman's struggle and triumph, and the topics run the gambit, from women who can't get pregnant to adultery, from molestation to murder. Lisa, there's an article that in the magazine, it's entitled Gone Too Soon, and it's about a woman that was in a domestic violence situation. No one knew that she was in this domestic violence situation. She was married for, I believe it was eight, nine years or something like that. They had two children and she would go to work every day, come home. You know, we actually fellowshiped with their family. We, our family and their family were friends. We did not know she was being abused. Um, and in the story, her husband killed both of the children and himself. And she's living and breathing every day. And these are the things that she has to go through. No one knew that he was abusing her. And no one knows what women face every day when they go home. So that those are the type of stories that are in Breathe Again magazine. Things that people can relate to but don't really want to talk about. So that's why I want to be able to connect women with women that have already gone through it so they can take them by the hand and help them. An amazing woman on an incredible mission. If you'd like to read some of the stories of the women profiled in Breathe Again magazine, just log on to our website at anotherview.tv and click on the Breathe Again link. While you're there, sign up for our weekly eView newsletter so you can be up to date on what's coming up on Another View or just send us your thoughts about the show. You can also write us at 5200 Hampton Boulevard, Norfolk, Virginia. Barbara gets to enjoy her vacation for one more week, and I'll be back next Thursday with four young people who will disintegrate the myth that Generation Wires care more about their PCs, CDs, PDAs, and DVDs than anything else. That's next week on Another View. Tonight, we leave you with another look at the sweet faces of children across the state of Virginia waiting for a good home.